Hello and welcome to this presentation on orbit analysis and centerline plots. My name is Jason Tranter, the founder and managing director of Mobis Institute. In this presentation we're going to briefly talk about uh, proximity probe measurements, the X and Y probe, the key phaser, and actually I won't talk much about thrust bearings, but we'll talk about the measurements and um, how the voltages come out and so on relative to distance between the probe and the shaft, but also talk about glitch removal. We'll talk about orbits, where the orbit comes from, the difference between filtered versus um, direct orbits and a little bit about what we can learn from the shape of the orbit. And then we'll talk about centerline plots. How is it developed and how do we use them? And just very briefly I'll talk about rotodynamics as well just to give you a little taste. It's worth commenting that this is a very deep and detailed topic. Um, we could spend a very long time talking about each one of these parts of the webinar, but obviously we don't have that long. For what it's worth, some of the issues we discuss here are actually you know, Category 2 topics, talking just basically about the measurements and using proximity probes and so on. That would be Category 2. And we introduce orbits in uh, Category 2 as well. In Category 3, we talk more about orbits and centerline plots and uh, you know, get, get into more about the shapes of the orbits and the centerline plots. Um, but Category 4 is really the place where we talk about this in much more detail. We talk much more about the different types of bearings and about rotor dynamics and the mass stiffness damping and rotor modeling and all sorts of things. So again, Category 4 is really the place where we talk about a lot of these topics. So in this presentation, you'll see little bits, I guess you'd say, from all three levels. But I hope you'll agree that the simulations and animations we use makes it all understandable, whatever level of uh, vibration analysis you're at at the moment. So in this presentation, you'll see um, a rotor uh, in quite a few of the animations uh, when we talk about everything from rotor dynamics to the bearings to orbits and so on. And just as a matter of interest, that rotor is actually um, uh, the one you see there, there's the real version of the rotor that we modelled for the um, measurements and animations and so on. So you can see it's uh, quite a, a large uh, rotor, 50,000 kilograms or 110,000 pounds, and it's from a, a 214 megawatt generator. So anyway, just if you're interested. And there it is, there's our modelled version of it. Now, of course, when we think about uh, the rotors and how they spin, and of course this would be attached to a generator on the left hand end of it, um, you, you can sort of imagine this thing just spinning and rotating and of course you wouldn't see any any movement. But in reality, if we sort of get into more detailed analysis, you'll, you'll see that they can flex and bend and there's all sorts of things we're interested in. So that's why we take these measurements, to give us an idea of just what is happening. Now, we only take measurements at certain points along that shaft, typically at uh, you know, close to uh, where the bearings are. Um, we know certain things about the, the sh shaft vibration. We, we know how much clearance there is in the bearing, so we know how much movement is tolerable, you might say. And we can imagine that with any unbalance or misalignment or preload and so on, that's going to affect the motion that that rotor goes through as it turns. Um, but there's more to it than that because when we look at the, the bearings themselves we have stability issues. How is it sitting on the little oil wedge and is there, are there any rubs and so on? And then we can think about the rotor as a whole. You know, does it just rotate in a, in a simple sort of rigid way or does it flex and bend? And as you'll see during this webinar or, or presentation, you'll see some of the ways that it can flex and bend. So let's just have a quick look at the possible rotor motions and then we'll see how we can understand that better with our orbits and centerline plots. So in our original one we've just got the rotor turning and um, you know we can imagine that that's just what it would do at all speeds but that's not the case. Now my animations here of course exaggerated, it's not physically moving that much, but it is moving with that sort of motion depending on the speed of operation, how close it is to its various uh, critical speeds. So that's one way it might might move, that's the same sort of way just viewed a little bit differently. 
In this case, we're looking at the end of the rotor, and you can see that the, you know, the rotor is making a circular motion in this case. Um, now, if we sort of look in the bearing itself, you can see that the, the rotor is moving in a, in a clockwise motion, and hopefully you can see there um, that not only is it physically spinning in a clockwise motion, but it's actually physically moving in a clockwise motion. And you might say, well, of course that's what it's doing. But actually there's a thing called reverse precession, where the rotation is in one direction, but the motion, the movement, is in the opposite direction. But um, when we look at the bearing in more detail, the ideal situation is where we've got this nice oil wedge that sits underneath the shaft, supporting that shaft. There's just a little bit of clearance here between the, the shaft and the uh, bearing, um, or between the journal and the bearing, and <clears throat> that oil wedge sets up and holds that shaft in place, or that rotor in place. Of course, again, my animations are exaggerated. The gap isn't, you know, nearly as large as what you're seeing there. But the aim, from a design point of view and an operation point of view, is that that oil wedge sets up, and that the load on that oil wedge is just right, so that there's no rubbing, and it's also stable. But of course, that's not always going to be the case, and that's where our measurements help us to identify what's really going on. Um, this is a much more extreme view of what the rotor might go through. This is a, a second bending mode. Now, it might look very complicated and um, uh, rather extreme, but that is basically what it's doing, you know, in a very amplified sense, you know, at a certain speed of operation. So these are the things we talk about much more in Category 4 to understand really what's going on. Okay, so... That gives us a taste of the sorts of things we're going to look for. Let's have a look at the measurements. How do we know what it's, what it's actually doing? So, as I mentioned just a moment ago, that's the operation we want. But, how do we know what the rotor's doing? Now, in a case like this, you can imagine that there might be some a circular motion uh, due to some unbalance or misalignment or something like that. Here we can't see any actual physical motion, but in reality there will be. Now, you've got to imagine though that if we took vibration readings up on the bearing housing, the question is how much of that motion is transferred through the oil wedge into the bearing and up onto the bearing housing how well can we measure that um, from the outside? And in truth, the answer is not very well. We need a better way to take the measurements. And that's what the proximity probes are for. They are there to actually measure the relative movement between the rotor and the bearing itself. And here are those probes installed. Now, okay, this is a slightly different bearing model, but same sort of deal, we've got the oil wedge set up, there's our shaft, and these probes are looking down at the shaft, and they are able to measure the distance or the gap between the probe tip and the surface of the shaft in, in both cases. And as you can see, there's actually a bigger gap here than here, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But with any sort of motion of that shaft relative to the bearing, and therefore relative to these probes, um, we will be able to measure that. And so I just want to briefly mention how those probes work, and just a few little facts which can tend to be very confusing when you look at this in, in any amount of depth. So basically, we will have a, a high-frequency oscillator that's used to induce an eddy current in the surface of the shaft. It's kind of like a little antenna. Um, it, it, it does not make contact with the shaft. It is a non-contact measurement. But as the distance between the probe tip and the shaft changes, more or less energy goes into the eddy current. So the output of this system is proportional to the, if you like, the instantaneous gap between the probe tip and the shaft. Um, now, I'm going to just briefly sort of look at a parallel sort of measurement and then I'll go into the prox probes in a little bit more detail. Imagine, if you will, that let's say this, this, uh, this is our shaft here under the mouse, and as it moves around, um, the displacement is changing. Now, in this case, I'm not using a proximity probe, I'm using this little 
dial indicator and as I push the plunger in the needle goes one way as I move the shaft away so the plunger gets to push back out again it moves the other way and if, if I had a cyclical motion here you can see the displacements changing and my little chart recorder over on the right is, is showing how that's movement moving and of course my motion right now isn't very smooth but we've got something that sort of looks sinusoidal now I can replace that with a proximity probe and it's doing the same sort of thing it's giving us the gap between the probe and the surface of the shaft at any time so let's have a look at that proximity probe in just a bit more detail so here we have it again um, what this plot is here is a typical sort of sensitivity plot for a proximity probe there's a certain gap in mils or microns and there's a certain voltage output so the transducer specifications will have a plot like this and show you what that sensitivity is you know how many uh, volts you get per um, uh, mil of vibration or of movement and so as I change this gap here you'll notice that as the shaft moves away from the probe we are getting a higher negative voltage that sort of gets confusing so is it higher or is it lower is the voltage higher as we move towards the probe or is it lower as we move towards the probe but this is actually what we get so with a bigger gap we get this larger negative voltage so larger negative voltage smaller um, negative voltage so one thing that I think is sort of easier to understand is if we flip the chart over we flip it over and <clears throat> now to me anyway it's it's more intuitive as it's closer the voltage sort of appears to go up more towards the positive and it goes down now if the shaft is actually rotating I'll do that instead so as the gap here between the two changes cyclically the voltage change changes which indicates a, a change in the gap which is what we expect if I if I sort of zoom in closer so that we can really see what's going on it's it's not seeing so much of the side-to-side -side motion just sort of looking at the surface of the um, of, of the shaft as it uh, moves towards it and away from it we see this cyclical motion and we can sort of see it as a sine wave as well anyway so going on to the next simulator let's change that to my proximity probe we can turn on our shaft and again you know uh, we've got this motion however you want to look at it but you'll see that it's a a sinusoidal motion it moves towards the probe and away from the probe now notice in this case I've only got one probe so that tells us in this case what the horizontal motion is we don't have any idea how much vertical motion there is so if I stop it moving for a minute and just move it back and forward if I could do that well all that probe knows is that it's moving towards it and away from it it has no idea whether it's moving up and down and that's why we have two proximity probes 90 degrees apart the two probes allow us to triangulate where the shaft is and if you like where the center of the shaft is but there's something else I wanted to mention the green dot here represents the position of the center of rotation so if we spin it again notice the green dot doesn't move and the actual center of the shaft the physical center of the shaft is moving in this case in a circular motion around that green dot we've placed there now right at the moment you can see that that green dot is sort of in the center of the bearing and it's all been set up so that we see this nice sinusoidal motion but if we do something and actually move the shaft physically closer to the probe and send, set it rotating again you notice that we've still got the sinusoidal motion but now there's like a bias to the voltage it's offset because even though the cyclical motion is the same it's doing it closer to the probe the gap between the probe tip and the center of that motion um, is now less than what it was before and if we do the opposite and just move it down over here so now the motion the same motion is occurring further away from the probe we have again this nice sinusoidal signal but it is offset differently
and that's why when we use proximity probes we use the signal in two different ways we look at the AC part which is just the sinusoidal part and that's not going to change um, wherever the the shaft is rotating so it's only concerned with the dynamic motion that side to side motion not that bias the bias voltage the offset voltage has been removed on the other hand if we look at the DC component that is sensitive to basically the distance between the probe tip and the green dot the center of rotation which happens to be the center of the orbit but we'll discuss orbits a bit more in a moment so if I stop it move it down here um, you can see that the gap voltage is different. The DC voltage is really just the average sort of center position of that sine wave. So there are our two primary signals that we're going to look at. The AC part shows us how much it's vibrating, if, if you like, or moving. Uh, and the DC part gives us that, that gap between the probe tip and the center position of the orbit or, or of the motion. So, as I mentioned, um, you know, we, we look at the DC part and the AC part from this, this signal system. Okay, now, one little thing, important thing though. The way that prox probe works, as I mentioned, it sets up an eddy current in the surface of the shaft. Now, if the surface of the shaft all the way around the uh, circumference of the shaft, the perimeter of the shaft, if that metal was all exactly the same and there were no flat spots no scratches no residual magnetism it was all perfectly uniform therefore the signal we get the signal strength of that eddy current would be only affected by the distance between the probe tip and the surface of the shaft but unfortunately those flat spots those scratches those uh, a non homogeneity I can never say that word homogeneity of the uh, metal of the uh, shaft and any magnetism and so on you can see the other things just here um, all of those things do affect the way that eddy current is set up so unfortunately it means that the prox probe is seeing not only the distance the variation due to the distance between the probe and the shaft surface it is also being affected by these these things so there is a solution to that and that is we run the machine at a low speed it has to be low enough that the shaft is not moving because of centripetal forces due to unbalance or dynamic forces or anything else it is simply rotating and therefore the distance between the shaft and the probe should not change and therefore if we record that signal we will get an indication of how much it does change as it rotates and we can do one of two things with it we can capture a waveform which is which represents one rotation of the shaft and then through the wonders of electronics and mathematics and signal processing and so on we can subtract that waveform from any future measurements because in theory that would compensate the signal for the glitches as they're often called on the shaft and that's why it's sometimes called slow roll compensation slow roll because we take the data at a, just a slow roll um, and we're compensating future measurements for those um, uh, problems we've just mentioned it's also often called uh, glitch removal as well because we're removing the glitches now it's not perfect but as I said we can capture it as a waveform but we can also um, create basically a, a vector at any speed a magnitude and a phase and that can be subtracted as well so you need to look at how your system does it but it is a problem and it does have to be dealt with so for example here we can see the uncompensated measurement that's filtered at 1x but there's our um, uh, uh, signal the raw signal here it is now that it's been cleaned up um, so in other words this is because I haven't mentioned exactly what direct and uh, 1x means just yet but this is a combination of the vibration at all frequencies and the slow roll um, when it hasn't been compensated here it is when it has been compensated so you can see it's much better than it was before
Okay, so as a result of all of this, as I mentioned, we install two proximity probes and they act as you know, a form of triangulation to say where is the shaft at any time. Now, they are typically 90 degrees apart. You can, in most systems, uh, compensate if those uh, probes aren't exactly 90 degrees. There might be physical reasons why that couldn't be done. Um, it's, uh, this is the Y probe and the X probe. There's a lot I could talk about uh, in terms of which is which, but basically if you imagine, generally speaking, going looking from the driver to the driven, you just need to have a system that, that is consistent. But from the driver to the driven, we look down the rotor, and if you, you know, uh, imagine putting your head between the two bearings, this is the Y, this is the X, even if this probe was located here and this probe was here, um, that would still be the Y probe and that would still be the X probe. The obvious case is where this probe is at the top and this probe is here and that's more obviously the Y probe and the X probe. But regardless of where they are, um, it's the Y probe and the X probe. Anyway, that's all we can say really for now. Now there's another application for the proximity probe and that is to get a once per revolution signal that gives us the timing information. It also gives us the speed. So we do need to know, particularly as the machine is running up to speed, exactly what speed it is at any time. As I'll mention in a moment, we have a good reason to filter away all the vibration other than 1x, uh, but we need to know what 1x. So there's a tracking filter that takes a once per revolution signal uh, from the machine. And this is what the uh, key phaser is for, that's sort of a, a brand name for it, but this uh, probe is going to look at some physical protrusion or inclusion on the shaft to give us that big step change in displacement and the obvious way is to look at a keyway. So in this case the, the it, it may see some motion in the shaft itself depending on where it's located um, but when this key comes by there's going to be a big change in displacement so it's going to step up in this case there's a big change in displacement but in the other direction either way the system will be designed to take that signal clean it up and create a once per revolution signal and in a moment when we look at orbits you'll see there's this dot on the orbit and that relates to the uh, timing or the position of this key phaser relative to when the high spot moves past the probes more on that in just a second. So therefore we have three probes. We may also have a thrust probe, um, maybe even a, a, a couple of them, maybe even a few of them. Looking at the axial movement, we're not going to talk about that. We've got the X and Y, which will be typically in one plane, and then the key phaser, which will be uh, axially in a different position along the shaft, along the rotor, um, because it's looking at the keyway. And we might have these ideally located near every bearing, but we only need one of these just to get the ones per rev. Um, lots more we could we could talk about all these things, but you know, we are pressed for time. Now what I want to show in this simulator is here is my key phaser, and it is the only thing looking at the keyway as it goes by. These probes are actually in a different position, and all they are are sensitive to the high spot of the shaft. Now, for simplicity, I've got my heavy spot, the big red dot there, which indicates the position of unbalance, if you like, and that is also the high spot. It's influencing the motion of the shaft. Now, when we get into this topic in more detail, there is, you know, as depending on the speed of the shaft, there will be a lag between the uh, high spot and heavy spot. Um, we don't have time to talk about that in this particular webinar. I'll just make it a bit simpler to look at by taking out some of the motion. What I really wanted to point out is that here we've got a sinusoidal signal coming from this probe, and here we've got a sinusoidal signal coming from this probe. This guy is giving us our timing reference. So just watch, uh, it's, unfortunately it's over here right now. We we'll, might have to wait for it to come and do another lap. I'm just going to speed it up a little bit and slow it, oops, I slowed it down a bit too quick. Okay, so watch what happens. 
as soon as this goes past the keyway we get our pulse that's our bright spot on the waveform it's then waiting until the high spot goes past this probe there's the high spot so the time between the keyway going past the key phaser which is here and the time that it uh, reaches the high spot in the signal from this probe in this case represents 80 degrees there's 360 degrees from here to here and there's 80 degrees from here to here. Now in this case I'm looking at the phase reading for this probe. If I just click here, now this is the probe. Now we actually just saw the heavy spot and in this case the high spot go past. We're just going to wait for a second. Let me just speed it up. I know you've all got other things to do. So we're going to slow it down now. So okay, here comes the key fa keyway. We see the pulse, we say, okay, let's start timing it. But we're waiting now for the high spot, which happens to be a heavy spot, to go past this probe. And we will see what the phase angle is. So this signal and this signal are now the same. And there it is, 70 degrees. Now, if you'd noticed before it was 80 degrees, here it's 70 degrees. And you might say, well, isn't that obvious? There's a 90 degree difference. But that's only when the shaft is moving in that nice circular motion. If it was moving in an elliptical motion, as other motions, the phase difference would not be the same. And therefore, we need the two probes, and we are interested in the phase angle for both of them. So, but that gives you an idea of the setup. As I mentioned before, these probes could be at any position, and therefore the readings we get will be different. This key phaser could be in a different position, and that's also going to influence the, um, the readings that we get. However, wherever we have all these things, if the shaft is moving in this circular motion, we will see 90 degrees between these two probes because they're physically 90 degrees apart. If they, in fact, I can just show you in this case still, that's still 90 degrees between the two because we're modeling circular motion. Anyway, more we could talk about there. Better keep moving, I suppose. So, I've mentioned the word orbit a few times. Let's explore the orbit in more detail. So, here is our axial view of the shaft again. There's the low pressure section here. There's our shaft. Now, journal just in there. Um, but you, if we watch that red dot on the end, we can see that it's moving in sort of a circular motion. And that's what the orbit's telling us. The orbit, which I've now drawn in green, let me just go back and start that again so we can talk about it. So, we're watching the red dot. It's very exaggerated, the movement there, very exaggerated, but we are interested in what that shape is. And now I'm tracing out that red dot, and you can see it's a, it's a green, well, green because that's the color I use, circle, because the shaft is moving in a circular motion. Now, if I happen to have XY probes here and here and here and here and here, then I could look at what the orbit looked like at every position along the rotor. Now that's getting into um, you know, rotor dynamics a little bit and you know, other issues, but the real key is I want to be able to look at the shape of that motion. If it's circular, it tells me one thing. If it's elliptical, it tells me something else. Um, just as a bit of you know, basic sort of fundamental stuff, you know, if we look at purely circular motion, you can see the um, you know, the two sine waves, you know, if you watch this red vector moving up and down in this, in this axis, which we can call the y-axis if we like, if we see this blue vector moving side to side in the x-axis, we get this sort of sine and cosine. In, in, this, in this instance, because they're 90 degrees apart, it's pure sine and cosine. We can talk about this in terms of imaginary and real part and quadraturian phase, but that's really for another day. So... Here we are, back again with our rotor, moving in a very exaggerated motion, but I hope you appreciate why we have to do that. And there it is, moving in a circular motion. So let's put our probes in place. We'll slow it down. We'll turn on our two prox probes. We'll turn on our key phaser. Again, there's more we could demonstrate here. But you can see now that this probe is only sensitive when that keyway there is 
facing the probe. Now it's it's a bit confusing when it's small like this, but and exaggerated like this. But when this sees that, boom, we get the bright spot. It's called the bright spot. It used to be done with oscilloscopes. Long story, but you know here when you look at a um, a time waveform or an orbit with Bentley Nevada systems and Emerson systems and these sorts of systems, the bright spot represents the, the point at which the um, key way or whatever the reference is go pa goes past your key phaser. Um, in this case you can see there's a blank spot before it and that's by convention now. It's regardless of whether this is, you know, an inclusion or a protrusion. Uh, standard convention these days is that we'll go blank bright with forward precision. So we are rotating in a clockwise direction. The motion is clockwise, and therefore, if we follow this waveform, we see blank bright. Um, anyway, so I'll just shrink that down again. The point is, though, that depending on the relative motion of the shaft, we can plot this x versus y to come up with this orbit shape. So it's often called a Lissajou figure. If I take a sine wave and plot it against another sine wave, it creates this circular motion. But watch what happens if, for example, I've got more amplitude in the x. Now, I've called it X, but really in the horizontal direction. You see now that, and this is not an unreasonable situation actually, because there's less stiffness in the horizontal axis, it therefore moves more horizontally. And our X probe is watching that horizontally, and we see now that the amplitude of this signal is higher than this one, and that gives us that orbit shape. And of course we can you know, make it more extreme, and when you saw something like that, you'd be saying, wow, you know, what's happening? Is there a lot less stiffness in this axis, or is there a lot more force acting vertically, which is restricting its movement vertically? So that's the thing. We don't really know why exactly the shape is like this. Is it simply allowed to move more in the x direction or is it not allowed to move more in the y direction? But either way, our proximity probes are showing us that. But this is where it gets a little bit tricky. What if my proximity probes are in a different location? You know, the orbit's not changing, but my signals are changing because now they're getting a similar view. But again, if we know where they are, the probes that is, uh, we know there's 90 degrees between them. From a software point of view, we can make adjustments so that the orbit always looks right. And that's the thing to just make sure if you're not using one of the brand name systems that the orbit is being adjusted based on the actual physical locations of the probes. You don't really want to have to grab your analyzer and put it on an angle or something to get it, you know, physically right. It, you know, you should be looking at it correctly. Um, so. This is one situation, and I'll just back off on, on that um, motion there. The other thing we can have is a phase difference between the signals. And the phase difference causes the orbit to rotate and tilt. So here we have a situation where it's very elliptical, which tells us one thing, and it's on an angle, which also tells us something. Notice something, though. If my X probe just happened to be in line with this ellipse, notice how much uh, higher amplitude my X signal is relative to my Y signal. Whereas if you watch those two signals and I rotate this around, you can see the amplitudes are lower. So that's just something to keep in mind with your alarm settings and trip settings. You know. If, if you've got the probe in this direction, you may not trip. If the probes happen to be here, it might trip. Um, just something to think about. That's, there's a measurement called S-max, which always figures out what that longest sort of axis uh, vibration level is, and you can trip on that instead. Just something to think about. But the orbit, as you can see, I mean, 
I am creating the orbit by fiddling with my uh, X and Y amplitude and phase values and I can also then say well what if there's some vibration at twice running speed oh look at the weird things I can do now it, it starts to do some oh boy um, some some very interesting things you know depending on what the phase relationships are we can get a you know a figure of eight we can get all sorts of interesting things and we can see reverse precession at certain times you know there's a lot that we could talk about the main thing I just want to point out now is that the X and Y probes give us that triangulation so that we can see basically where the center of the shaft is moving at any time that dynamic motion as it's rotating. Now that rotor or that shaft is responding to the unbalance effects, uh, any misalignments or other sort of preload factors, it's responding to any instability in the fluid film, um, it might be rubbing, you know there are other things that could be going on and that shape of the orbit is telling us what the rotor itself is doing and therefore we have to kind of reverse engineer to say why would the orbit look like that and uh, there's an, a number of ways we can do that but we can certainly say well let's filter out well that was a bit extreme um, let's filter out the 2x vibration and just consider the 1x vibration I just turned off the 2x vibration but um, anyway it's all very important to be able to see what that orbit shape is and then understand you know, how the various failure modes are going to affect uh, the shape of our orbit. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of what the orbit is. The X and Y probe give us the relative uh, change in uh, displacement that they are seeing as they watch the probe. Uh, we plot those two signals together. That gives us the uh, shape of the orbit. Now, I've mentioned it a couple of times that I can look at just the 1x motion or the all all of the motion. So imagine when when the proximity probes or whatever you want to call them, yeah, non-contact eddy current probes, um, when they watch that shaft go around, we've already said we've got the glitch that's sort of superimposed on it, which we hopefully can compensate and remove. But they are also sensitive to all the motion. So yes, it's rotating once per revolution, but there's a 2x component to the vibration. There might be a 3x and a 4x. There might be vibration from half x or less than that or more than that, just depending on what's going on. So those probes are seeing everything. So in this instance, we see this orbit shape here looks more complicated than what we've seen so far, and that's because it is unfiltered. It might be compensated it might have this the glitch removed but it is unfiltered we're seeing the 1x and the 2x and the half x and and all those signal components but what we can do and, and we often call that the direct measurement it might be called the unfiltered measurement maybe other names used in other systems it's just basically the raw voltage but typically compensated for a glitch in this instance we've filtered away all other vibration we are only looking at 1x vibration in this instance and it cleans it right up. Now if all we think about is the unbalance effect um, and maybe preload and how that changes the, the basic motion of the shaft then you know that 1x filtered orbit will tell us a lot but as we'll see there are, there are definitely times when you want to look at both the direct orbit and the filtered orbit. So again with my animations here's a sort of a simple sort of case where there's not much motion there's ideally a little oil wedge sitting under here hopefully you can tell through the replay of this you know, it's, it's animating smoothly I can't quite tell what you're seeing but um, it's just a nice little orbital movement and we can look at that and, and draw a conclusion if we looked at an orbit and now the amplitudes are much greater we can again look at the shape of the orbit and see that it's slightly elliptical which is normal but it's not a tilted ellipse so I might look at that and say okay my unbalanced forces are now higher significantly higher than they were just a moment ago I'm getting a lot of motion I can see it's still forward precision it's moving around blank bright
blank bright. So that's all good. Uh, it's slightly elliptical. So I can draw the conclusion that there's some unbalance. So that's all good. When we see a tilted orbit, it's elliptical. Um, and it's now tilted, that tells me that there's some sort of force doing that. Uh, it could be thermal reasons, it could be, you know, what the steam jets are doing, it could be misalignment, but it's, you can visualize maybe that there's this force moving in the direction of my mouse, sort of coming down in this angle, and it creates that, that ellipse that we're seeing. The ellipse is just telling us what it's doing, you know, where those probes are located, which is an important little thing. We only really know what's happening where those probes are located. Um, in this instance, imagine that that force coming in this direction is even greater. It's so, um, it, it's so forceful, if that's the right word, um, that it even creates this figure of eight. So the, the rotor is moving in this sort of figure of eight motion because there's of this high preload. Um, in this instance, and again, you know, I have to try and exaggerate and mimic these things, but you can see there's a, perhaps there's a higher force due to unbalance, let's say, but at a certain point, it's coming up and making contact with the side of the bearing. And if you look at the orbit, it's, it's flattened off. In this instance, it's actually coming up, making contact, going through a loop, going back up, making contact. Um, and that's, again, something that we can see with um, a rub. Um, we can see a teardrop shape with a rub. We can see the sort of flattened off case in here. We can see this situation as well. So the orbit tells us what's going on. Now this is this is a bit harder to see. I've got two animations to try and explain it. Hopefully you can see that this shaft is turning once per revolution. Hopefully you can see the sort of the shiny bit turning. But if you watch the actual motion, the physical motion of the shaft, it is moving much more slowly than it is turning. Um, so in actual fact, the motion, like if I follow the motion with my mouse, you can see it takes much longer to, to go through its motion than it does to turn. In fact, that motion is somewhere between 0.38 and 0.48 of the speed of the machine. In this case, it's 0.42, I think, is what, what I actually modeled. But you can see there's a very dominant motion. Now, Remember, a shaft is being influenced by a lot of things. So there might be both a 1x sort of motion superimposed on, or the other way around, on this high amplitude, uh, lower frequency, subsynchronous vibration. And the, the proximity probe's picking up the entire motion, but from a frequency point of view, we can see that some of it's low frequency and some of it's at 1x. If I just skip to the next slide, now we're actually drawing the orbit. Now, it's turning around, but it rotates once, and we see the key phaser again. It rotates again, sees the key phaser again, rotates again, and sees the key phaser again. So, it's a very important clue. When we see orbits with multiple dots, we suspect that there's sub-synchronous vibration. And depending on the number of dots and something else I'll mention in just a moment, um, we can tell whether it's less than half x, exactly half x, or more than half x. Um, so the key thing is that if we see multiple dots, then we know that the dominant vibration uh, is at a lower frequency than the rotational speed. So here we go again. So here is what we looked at just a moment ago. Uh, we've got rotation in the clockwise direction, and there is our filtered orbit, which is actually what we were looking at a moment ago, and there's our two dots. We'd only ever see two dots at once, depending on how many rotations of the shaft we saw at any time. If we looked at the direct orbit, so the orbit that includes the 1x vibration and the 0.42x vibration, we get two dots, but we get this little inner loop. Um, so the shaft has sort of made this motion. There's some 1x vibration there and some 0.4x. The key is that if we could look at these orbits live, like actually watch them while the machine's running, um, we see something quite interesting. If you watch, okay, I'm drawing out the orbit just so you see it, and it's refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. Notice that the orbit seems to be turning in a counterclockwise motion. 
even though the shaft is turning in a clockwise motion. Um, see, the orbit's moving in this direction, the shaft is moving in this direction, and that's because this vibration is less than half x. If it was exactly half x, it wouldn't rotate. If it was higher than half x, it would rotate, but in the same direction as the shaft motion. I'll, if you like, so it's not distracting, I'll turn that one off, and I'll turn this one on. So again, now I'm just looking at the 1x orbit. So all we see is the two dots. We don't see the extra loop because we filtered that vibration out. But we will see the orbit rotate. And that's an important thing. Now, I'd, we've got all these simulators that help explain this much more, but we, so we're running out of time here. So, um, Okay, so let's talk about the center line plots. Um, first thing to mention is that everything that we've talked about in relation to orbits tells us what the center of the shaft is doing. You know, is it circular motion, elliptical motion, and so on. But we don't know where it is doing it. Is that motion in the center of the bearing? Is it in the upper right, lower left, and so on? That matters. That really matters. Because we might even have an orbit that doesn't look too bad. But if it turned out it wasn't in the correct location within the bearing, that can show that we're vulnerable to uh, instabilities in that fluid film. We might get oil whirl and even oil whip. So we want to know where that's happening. Now, I've got a few little simulators to try and explain that. I'm, I'm going to start with an explanation and then show you my simulator and Hopefully, it'll all make more sense. So, number one, the centerline plot is, uh, uses that DC voltage that I mentioned earlier, the gap voltage. It's sensitive to where the center of the orbit is. Again, it has to use the two probes so that it can use the triangulation. What we do is when the machine is, is at rest or just started, we're going to make the pretty safe assumption that the shaft is at the bottom of the bearing. It can't go any further down. Um, now, you have to look at this in context of vertical machines and other situations, but let's just keep it at that. We've also got to think about tilting pad bearings with uh, load between pads and these sorts of things. But just for now, let's keep it simple. The, the shaft is at the bottom of the bearing so we can take our gap readings and say okay well we know that that's the center of the bearing and we at the bottom of the bearing sorry and we know how much clearance there is in the bearing so therefore we know how much that shaft should be able to move before it's rubbing so we take a reading at a, at a low speed and we say, okay, that's the bottom of the bearing. And then we monitor where the center of the orbit is uh, as the machine runs up to speed and when it's normally operating. So here's a new simulator that I hope will help to explain this. So here's our bearing, here's our proximity probes, and here's the shaft. And I can drag it around. Now, when the machine starts, the shaft is going to be at the bottom and hopefully it's going to be right in the center. So it's sitting down there and I know that this X point here, this cross, cannot move any further down. So we take our proximity probe readings and we say, okay, that's the bottom. Now if I drag it around the bearing, you can imagine that it, it could be tracing out a circle. That When it's tracing out that circle there, that is the available clearance in the bearing. I don't ever expect to take these gap readings and see that the, that the triangulated position of the center of the shaft is anywhere outside that circle I'm drawing. So rather than using your imagination, there is the circle. They, that yellowish circle there is the available clearance in the bearing. The, the shaft can move anywhere in here, anywhere, um, and it's not rubbing. Once we try to go outside that circle, we're rubbing. Now, of course, we've got different bearings, and therefore the clearances are different. You know, we've got a lemon bearing, we had an elliptical, we've got tilting pad bearing, uh, load on pad, load between pad, you know, different 
different designs, but for each of them we have the available clearance. And hopefully we know what that is. We know we can't move any further this way, we can't move any further that way. So, when we look at the orbit, we know that there's a certain motion somewhere. In fact, rather than using your imagination, we'll, we'll spin it. Now, apologize, we're spinning in a counterclockwise direction now, so the dynamics are a bit different. But let's make our orbit. Now, in this case, you can see what the orbit shape is, and you can see where in the bearing the orbit or the shaft is orbiting. I can drag it and move it up here. And now you can see that it's the same orbit, but it's doing it up in the top right of the bearing. Is that good? What if it was doing it up here? Um, the orbit itself is very useful, but we want to know whether it is close to rubbing, for example. We also want to know whether it's stable. Now, I'll just turn off that motion for a second. The fact is, let's go back to a circular just to keep things simple. The fact is that for proper stability in a um, circular spherical bearing or an elliptical bearing even, we want for a counterclockwise rotating shaft, we want it to be sitting around here. We're going to have a nice little oil wedge sitting underneath the bearing, uh, under the shaft and everything is stable. When that's the situation, we can go home at night and sleep really well. That's the way it's designed to work. In the case of a tilting pad bearing, actually the nice safe place is right up above the pad. They're designed differently. We don't have time to go into that right now. But the desired location of the rotor when it's spinning differs depending on whether it's a tilting pad bearing or an elliptical bearing or a lemon bearing. You know, there's just different designs. But in this instance, for a rotor turning counterclockwise, that's where we want it. For a rotor turning clockwise, that's about where we want it. So even though my orbit's just a, a little bit big for the sake of what I'm talking about just at the moment, we, we want to know what the orbit shape is, but we want to know that it's orbiting in a stable location. So again, this is all very exaggerated, but that's the motion there. And I'll just, um, oops, just enlarge that, you know, the center line plot is telling me right now that the center of the orbit is, is here. Now, actually, in counterclockwise rotating, I want it to be there. So if I see that the orbit itself is telling me one thing, uh, the center line plot's telling me a another very useful piece of information. And in fact, in a situation like this with such an elliptical orbit, I might even expect it to be closer to the edge of the bearing because that preload force that's making this elliptical is putting that extra force on. But anyway, look, we could talk about those things for quite a while. The point is that the centerline plot is telling us where in the bearing this is all happening. The orbit is telling us what that motion is. So for example, here's the way this can be applied. What I'm going to do is start a sweep or a, or a run up. And it's going to start sitting down here in the bottom of the bearing. And we've started the machine and it's turning very slowly. You can see it's turning very slowly, perhaps a little bit too slowly. Um, what's going to happen is potentially with that slow motion that we're seeing there, it might even just ride up the bearing just a little bit. It just might ride up the bearing a little bit. And as those forces become greater and greater, it's going to move perhaps over where we want it. Now if you watch down here, I'm leaving these little red crosses to show with different intervals of time, which are also different intervals of machine speeds, where the center of the orbit, or the center of the average center position of the shaft, is located. And then we can look at that as a plot, and we can see, okay, it moved up a little bit, I probably moved it a bit too far, and then it moved across and moved over into this quadrant. So this is very important. As the machine's running up, I watch the orbit to see what's going on, 
I actually watch the orbit for each of you know our sets of prox probes, and I watch the centerline plot, and I make sure you know as I go through critical speeds, what's happening, you know where is it sitting within the bearing, how's my alignment, how's my preload, how's how's everything, you know, have I got a bend? All sorts of things can be determined from these uh, two pieces of information. Um, if I see that it starts doing this, it's like, uh oh, okay. What that means is there's not very much pressure on the oil wedge. This is no longer very stable. We can get oil whirl happening where the oil starts schlepping over the top of the shaft and we get, um, if that higher vibration that occurs as a result um, happens to coincide with the critical speed of the rotor, um, then we can have oil whip and that's where the shaft potentially just starts chewing out the inside of your bearing. Anyway, lots of things we could talk about that's why we run training courses but the key is and sorry now I'm rotating uh, uh, clockwise again we want to know where is it occurring in this case it's in the center of the bearing and given that it's not a tilting pad bearing this is not a good place it's a lot of motion you know there's less sort of forces acting on the rotor um, from the fluid film um, unbalanced forces and so on Anyway, we can we can begin to interpret what's going on. Here is a sample plot, which is which is quite clever because it's showing us. So this this is the clearance of the bearing. We can see the position of our X and Y probe. There's the direction of rotation. This is a tilting pad bearing. So in this case, the machine sped up, sped up, sped up, sped up, sped up. Got to operating speed, and there's the unfiltered or direct orbit showing that motion so it's you know we've got a circular sort of orbit slightly elliptical so thumbs up to that um, and we're you know in, in a good location so you know that comes from the data physics software they gave me the plots so I should say that but um, you know you need to look at your particular software to see how that that functionality works okay so here are a few quick examples so here we've got the direct orbit a filtered orbit and um, um, you know the center line plot to show that it ran up now this time we've got clockwise direction so we want it over there and you can see there's a little bit of um, preload just a there's a bit of preload and it's sitting here in this case now we've got a very elliptical but vertically elliptical which would suggest a lot of force coming from this side and that's supported by our center line plot we can see that it's sort of being pushed up up higher uh, than it should be and here we've got even greater preload we've turned it into a figure of eight orbit for our direct orbit and um, our centerline plot showing that this is all happening you know way over the side of the bearing so you know there could be um, you know a, a rub potentially happening but certainly it's it's up against the edge of the bearing okay so I'm just going to very briefly mention uh, mention rotor dynamics. Now, we've mentioned it a little bit so far because the fact is that while we are interested at in what's happening at each of the bearings, that is of great interest to us. We're interested in rubs. We're interested in you know, stability and these sorts of things. We're very very interested in what the whole um, rotor is doing. And in this case, we've you know, mimicked having uh, five sets of prox probes just for the sake of mimicking it and you can see that the motion is the same at each of them so the orbit shape and everything and size is the same but you know depending on the motion that can give us orbits that look quite different and in this case you can see that there's a phase relationship as well here um, an important part of the uh, rotor dynamics is we want to model the shaft and then consider modeling what it's coupled to so in this case we might even start you know with the the blank sort of casting and see how that um, might uh, vibrate um, and then add each of the discs to it and see how they affect things add this graphic coupling to it and turning gear and so on um, and then couple it to the generator so we can from a modeling perspective you know see how this all works and then we can see that for example as this machine runs up to speed we may see that we're operating this machine above second or even third critical of the turbine but maybe uh, just over the second critical 
of the generator. They won't both have the same uh, critical speeds or same natural frequencies. You know, this will go through a critical, then that'll go through a critical, this will go through a critical, and that'll go through a critical. Obviously though, they are coupled together, they do affect each other. So this is a critical for the uh, turbine, uh, turbine, this is the critical for the generator. And so here we've got this sort of, you know, simple sort of first bending mode, if you like. Um, you can see it's, it's causing the turbine to move, um, but uh, the turbine at that same speed isn't going through any you know, bending modes or translational pivotal modes. Um, so the idea is that if you're taking measurements on a machine and you look at the orbit shapes, you can compare the orbits from different positions and look at the phase relationship to tell, you know, is it pivoting, bending, you know, what's it doing, is there more vibration at some locations than others, um, and if there are problems you can, you know, go ahead and look at modelling the rotor and you may need outside consulting assistance to, to perform that, but, you know, if you understand the dynamics of the of the whole system, uh, which includes the stiffness uh, provided by the bearings and the damping provided by the bearings, um, then you can model the whole thing and, and see what might be going wrong with the machine. Um, there's a, a lot we could talk about in, in this particular area, but um, it's certainly a, a process you may have to go through depending on what you're seeing with uh, the vibration readings, the orbits and centerline plots. The other important point to understand is that when you go to balance a machine, it's really important to understand this sort of thing because the relative position of the heavy spot and high spot or the high spot relative to the heavy spot is going to change depending on whether we're operating above first critical, second critical and so on and that affects you know, where we're going to place trial weights and, and so on. Anyway, lots of wonderful things I'd love to tell you more about. Um, I've taken up an hour of your time already. You know, I really hope you've found this, this presentation useful. I hope you feel a bit more comfortable with the prox probe measurements themselves, the orbit measurements, the uh, centerline plots and maybe even uh, rotodynamics as well. Um, if you have any interest in, in uh, Mobius or this particular topic, um, please uh, email me if you have general inquiries just to, about our courses and products and so on. I'd invite you to email learn at Mobius Institute. Just in case you're not aware, we have training centres in over 50 countries. Uh, they service about 60 countries. We have students from about 140 countries. Uh, we have courses for category 1, 2, 3 and 4 but we also have training for balancing and alignment. Uh, we have a product that can help you analyze spectra. We have a suite of e-learning um, uh, lessons and, and so on called iLearn Reliability um, that can help you avoid some of these sorts of problems particularly with rolling element bearing machines and so on. Understanding improving reliability and maintenance practices and operating procedures and and all that sort of thing but uh, if you enjoy this this form of learning if you visit our website which I actually haven't got sitting there but it's mobiusinstitute.com mobiusinstitute.com you will find that we have quite a few of these movies these free um, presentations uh, that talk about all kinds of topics so feel free to go in there and you can see um, what our training's like but you can learn a lot and please uh, feel free to learn as much as you can from our website. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to view this presentation. I hope you've uh, uh, learned something from it. Bye.